What's up everybody? My name is Nick. I am a drummer, bassist, producer, and music lover. And you're not seeing my face this time because this is just going to be kind of a rundown of all of my favorite music from 2022. Now you might be thinking, Nick, it's 2024. And I kind of touched on this in my last video, but <clears throat> it takes me a while to get through everything that I want to get through from a certain year of music. Currently, as I'm recording this, I'm still working through August of 2023. So, uh, yeah, these lists are kind of go going to go up when they go up. But here is this one for 2022. And I'm going to start off by going genre by genre with my top 10 of each genre. So I'm not going to talk too much. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so we're going to get started by kicking it off with my top 10 albums in the metal genre and all of its subgenres. Coming in at number 10, we've got Altered Pasts by Thought Crimes. This one comes highly recommended if you're a fan of bands like the Dillinger Escape Plan, that kind of chaotic, mathy, hardcore uh, style. The production on this is a bit beefier and thicker than on a lot of Dillinger's stuff, so I kind of tend to prefer that production style, though um, I don't think that this is on the same level as Dillinger. That's just a personal opinion, though. It is still very good, and I do recommend it if you are into that kind of thing. Coming in at number nine is Void by the band Scalar, formerly known as Scalping. This is a nice little chunk of industrial metal, mostly instrumental with a couple of vocal features um, on the album. It's very along the lines of like 90s Nine Inch Nails, uh, the band Ice with Justin Broderick and Kevin Richard Martin, uh, Techno Animal, that kind of thing. It's kind of in that same vein and it's really good. And then at number eight, we have God's Country by Chat Pile, an Oklahoma City-based band. Um, this album got a, quite a lot of buzz when it came out, a lot of mixed reviews. I know a lot of people really hated it, uh, and a lot of people really loved it, and there kind of wasn't a lot of in-between. Um, obviously, it's made it here to my top ten, so you can tell which camp I'm in. It's just a... Uh, it's a singular piece of work. Um, if you're into sludge metal, like uh, I Hate God, stuff like that, kind of New Orleans sludge scene, uh, I think you'll dig this one. The vocals are unhinged, the instrumentals are punishing, and it's not a fun time, but it's a good time. And here at number seven, we have Communion by Grave Lines. This is a nice chunk of stoner metal uh, on the heavier side of the genre, so it's a little bit more aggressive than stuff like Clutch or Nebula, kind of closer to uh, Kylesa or Torch on the instrumental side, but with more growly vocals. Not quite screamed, but more yelled. Uh, and it's slow, it's thick, it's riffy and just banging your head the whole time. But it's got a few like more open jammy sections as well that I really enjoy in this kind of music. And here at number six, we have the album Swarm Life by the band Del Void. This is, I would call it post-metal, but it's a little proggy, a little mathy, a little new. Uh, it's got kind of a nice blend of subgenres in there. Definitely recommend if you like bands like Tool, Carnival, Isis, Pelican, things of that nature. And this one's really cool. This is number five. It is Pyramiden by Sick or Psych. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but man, this thing is cool. So it's black metal riffs played with gent tones with prog metal song structures and theater kid metal vocals. And by theater kid metal, I mean Evanescence, Nightwish, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, it's just, it's a wild blend of sounds, but it works. And it's bookended, like most of the tracks are three, four minutes, but it's bookended by a 10 minute track to start and an eight minute track to end. So you know, there's something for everyone on this one. And at number four, we've got another wild one. This is Liminal by Pet Brick, which is a project featuring Igor Cavalera of the band Sepultura. He was their drummer. He's also been in uh, some other bands. You can look him up. He's done a lot of stuff. Um, this is an industrial metal album at its core, but it has a lot of different influences from hip hop to hardcore to doom metal to the more glitchy side of electronic music. And it features guest vocals from a couple of rappers on there and uh, Steve Von Till from Neurosis and Jacob Bannon from Converge. So that should give you kind of a little clue as to the variety on this one. Definitely recommend checking this one out. It's awesome. And then at number three, we have From the Fathomless Deep by Behold the Monolith. Now this is a band and album that lives up to its name, its cover art, everything. This album feels like riding a storm on the ocean. And, you know, there's times when it's just blazing fast. There's times when it's painfully slow. It just crawls. And there's something just sinister lurking under the surface of this album. And it's fucking awesome. I love this album. It's proggy. It's got death metal. It's got doom metal. It's right up my alley. All right, y'all. This is number two. But for a long time, until I heard the album that is at number one, this was my number one, not only in metal, but overall for the year. This album is fucking crazy. I love it. And... It's called Commando, self-titled album by the band Commando. Um, and I know there's been like a resurgence of new metal recently, especially last year, 2023, with uh, the Memorage album that dropped. And now don't get me wrong, that album deserves all the hype it's been getting. And I'll talk about that one when I do my 2023 top list, because it will be on there. Um, but that album is sort of getting credited with really really boosting the new metal revival that's happening right now but it should have been this album this is pure new metal it is unapologetic it is in your face it does not give a fuck and it's so good it is so fucking good the lyrics the riffs the bass, the funk influences, the hip-hop influences, everything on this just fits together so well, and it's amazing. So, honestly, if you are a fan of, like, Korn, Rage Against the Machine, Public Enemy, any of, like, the classic new metal bands, give this one a shot. You will not be disappointed. And finally, my favorite metal album from 2022 this is Shiki by Sai. They are a Japanese band that is over 30 years into their career by now. Um, and honestly, they've been a blind spot for me, for me for a while. I've known about them, but this is actually the first full album of theirs that I've listened to. And I don't know if they're always like this, but the way they bring black metal influence to everything from like doom metal to power metal to thrash is insane and if I remember correctly they're a duo I think it's just two people in the band I don't know correct me if I'm wrong feel free uh, definitely need to get more into Psy because this album is fucking awesome it is front to back bangers like pretty damn close to a perfect album I would say so, yeah, that's my initial impression of Psy and the 
these were some of the metal records that I loved the most in, not in, but from 2022. So let's move on to the next genre. All right, we're going to get into my top 10 hip hop albums now. Let's go. And first up at number 10 is Mount Westmore, consisting of Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, E-40, and Too Short, four absolute legends of the California hip-hop scene. And they're on here doing what they do best. It's solid front to back. It's, I mean, you know, it's a super group, so take that as you will. But honestly, I like this record. I think it's really good. At number nine, we got Finally New by They Hate Change. And this thing is a set of vocals that would work really well on their own. And a set of instrumentals that would work really well on their own. And it combines them into something that also works really well as a unit. Uh, it's got these crazy like drum and bass instrumentals taking cues from 90s Big Beat House and IDM and stuff like that over some really solid flows, great lyrics, and just really unique deliveries. So definitely worth checking this one out. Number eight is Pug Ugly by Insane Clown Posse. And if you told me at any point in my life before the day that I listened to this album that I would have an ICP album on my top anything list except for like top worst, uh, I wouldn't have believed you. But man, they're fun. They're really fun and I'm mad that I didn't uh, give them a chance sooner. But yeah. Whatever you think you know about them, if you don't listen to them, you might be wrong. Open your mind, give, your, give them a chance, give yourself a chance. It's pretty good. And number seven is Melt My Eyes, See Your Future by Denzel Curry. I did react to one of the singles from this record, uh, Zatoichi, on the channel when that dropped. And yeah, the album didn't disappoint. It's solid front to back. Denzel is... Probably one of my favorite rappers from the past like 10 years. Uh, he's doing his own thing and it works. A lot of great features on this album, a lot of great beats, and a lot of great flows. Number six is Shape Up by Lee Kelly 47. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but if you've been on social media in the past two years, you've probably heard the song Chitty Bang. It was all over TikTok and Instagram reels and whatever. Um, and it's a great song. Don't get me wrong. That's actually why I wanted to listen to the full album. Um, but the album's a lot more than just that song, too. It has those abrasive hip-hop moments on there. Um, but it's also got a few slower, more R&B-focused songs on there that really form a cohesive whole. So if you're only familiar with Chitty Bang, highly recommend listening to the full album number five sing me a lullaby my sweet temptation by suicide boys uh, man suicide boys are great and hearing them do like a full straight horror core record is awesome it's one of my favorite subgenres of hip-hop in the first place and they execute it really really well love the production on this love the vocals love the whole like tripped out feel of it it is fantastic and at number four is space ghost revenge by rocky tirade uh, i didn't know anything about this dude before i listened to this but just energetically and with his flows and beats and just the whole kind of vibe reminds me a lot of bus driver just got that like chaotic weird kind of flow that works really well with the instrumentals on this record and there's a lot of uh variation on those instrumentals you got everything from classic 90s hip-hop beats to more edm and dubstep influenced stuff and even some like weird glitchy free jazz kind of stuff so 
it's definitely a wild ride. Uh, some of the songs are up to like six or seven minutes long on there, and they don't feel overly long. So, yeah, I like this one. Definitely going to be looking out for more from Rocky Tirade. Number three is Component System with the Auto Reverse by Open Mike Eagle, who at this point is over a decade into his career, a household name in the underground conscious hip hop scene. Like, you pretty much know what you're going to get with Open Mike Eagle. Consistently great. The instrumentals, the lyrics, the flows, everything about it just. It's instant classic and another solid entry into Open Mike Eagles discography. And at number two on my list of top 10 hip hop albums from 2022 is Porno Violence by AV Dummy. This is their debut release and god damn it's a hell of a debut. From the first like 30 seconds of the first track Brave New World They've already crammed in so many ideas into just that little snippet, and it only gets crazier from there. There's everything from harsh noise to live instrumentation to, like, Mr. Bungle-esque tempo and feel and genre changes, all with these really in-your-face vocals, and the whole thing is just abrasive start to finish. 40 minutes it doesn't let up and I mean that in the best way possible I'm so looking forward to their next release and at number one is His Happiness Shall Come First Even Though We Are Suffering by Backwash which is on my hip hop list but it would easily be at home on my metal or punk lists as well it fits neatly and not so neatly into all three genres It's a beautiful blend of aggression and social and religious commentary and just everything about this record is fantastic. Can't recommend it enough if you're into the more abrasive side of hip hop. All right, now let's get into my top 10 electronic albums. To start off, we have number 10, which is Profound Mysteries 2 by Rugsop, which is the second part, obviously, of a three-part trilogy that they released over the course of 2022. Um, And all three albums were really good, but the first one didn't make the cut uh, for my top 10. So we're starting off with number 2, which is a very solid chunk of ambient and acid house that the group is known for. And then at number nine, we have the self-titled album by Fall Therapy. And I love an album where the music sounds like the album cover looks. This is definitely one of those. It's very floaty. It's got a lot of nice pad synths on it and some sharper uh, melodic synths and rhythmic synths on it as well but it's a good way to just kind of get lost in some tones for a little over an hour. And at number eight, we have Skids and Angels by Tobacco. And I don't know how much I've talked about Tobacco and Black Moth Super Rainbow on this channel before, but BMSR is one of my favorite bands. I actually plan on getting their logo tattooed on me at some point. Um, They're very important to me. and Tobacco's solo work has always been phenomenal as well. This album is a hell of a new sound for him. And I think on the first couple of listens that I did, it, you know, it didn't really click as much as some of his older stuff is. It's kind of missing the melody and the, uh, that like abrasive funk vibe that he's kind of known for on his earlier work but I think this one's going to grow on me and if I were to redo this list um, in I don't know a year or so after spending some more time with all the albums on it this album would probably be higher and there are a lot of really 
gorgeous moments on this one. So I think this one's going to be a grower for me. This one at number seven is Anima Mundi by this by from Cairo, who is not actually from Cairo. I believe he's from New York. But that aside, it is a record of the sort of dubby house music that you'd expect from like Thievery Corporation. Um, it's in that same vein. And it's a nice way to just provide a background but it also rewards deeper listening as well. There's a lot of intricate details on there uh, that show a lot of his influences from music from around the world. All right, number six, we have 05-10 by Clark. Clark is, for those of you who don't know, an IDM artist on Warp Records. He started a bit later than a lot of the classics like uh, Square Pusher, Autekker, Aphex Twin, people like that. But in a lot of ways, his output has been a lot more varied and a lot more um, experimental. And I might get some heat for saying this, but I think that modern Clark is probably, not probably, I think it's definitely better than anything FX has put out since, like, Cyro. That's just my opinion. But there it is. And speaking of IDM, here at number five we have Hello by Music, who is another pioneer of the genre who incorporated a lot more drum and bass and breakcore elements into it. Um, I haven't really gotten as much into his back catalog as I would like to. I've heard his first three or four albums, a couple of his middle era albums, and now um, this one, which he released in 2022. He seems to be getting more prolific, actually. He's released a string of albums in the past four or five years that uh, this is the only one I've actually gotten around to yet. Uh, but it's good. It sounds like his classic style, but updated for the 21st century for the 2020s and I won't say that you always know what you're going to get with music because he does have a lot of variation in his sound but I feel like this record in particular is very indicative of the sound that he kind of developed in the mid 90s after Lunatic Harness and you can hear a lot of those same uh, melodic choices and synth tones on this album that you can hear in his earlier stuff. And at number four, we have more IDM with The Trees Were Buzzing and The Grass by Word Color. Um, Word Color is not a classic IDM artist, as you may have guessed, uh, but they do seem to be keeping the genre alive. This sounds like it could have come out at any time between like 1997 and when it did come out 25 years after that so it's both timeless and modern it has a lot of like edm and dub and club music influences on there but it keeps that same uh frantic yet melodic foundation that the genre is known for. So if you're not familiar with this one and you like IDM as a genre, I would highly recommend checking this one out. And at number three, we have a repeat offender on the list, Rooksop's Profound Mysteries number three, the finale of the trilogy, and the best entry in it, in my opinion. This one still has that Rooksop sound, but it incorporates a lot of disco and funk and almost synth wavy aesthetics and uh, sonics into it that I think really bring it into new territory for the group and it's an improvement on their sound that I really enjoyed. And at number two on my favorite electronic albums list we have 
Exuvium, Oblivion Part 2 by Crywolf, which I have tagged in my notes as um, having the subgenre as dubstep, hyperpop, and witch house. And like, yeah, sorta, but really this album sounds like James Blake meets Nine Inch Nails. Um, which those five things don't sound like they should work together, but honestly, they do. And this album is awesome. For number one, we're back to IDM with Lexicon by Lennon. Uh, this time it's more in the vein of Autecker than Aphex Twin or Music. It kind of sounds like Autecker trying to make trance music or like EDM. Which, whether you think that sounds awesome or terrible, I guarantee you it's better than you think it sounds. And moving on, we have my favorite pop albums from 2022. And to start us off, we have Motomami by Rosalia. Another one that if you've been on social media in the past two years, you've probably heard Biscochito. Uh, but what you might not know, if you haven't heard the full album, is that prior to Biscochito, the two tracks that come before it, one of them features Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest on backing vocals. And one of them is produced by The Neptunes, aka Chad Hugo and Pharrell Williams. Um, and it's a ballad. It's a piano ballad called hentai if that gives you any indication of how wild this album actually is and it's so good i love this album and here at number nine we have another latin pop album this one is nena trampa by kazu um, not much to say about this one other than it's really fucking good it's got this like Latin pop combined with hyper pop feel to it, and it's a wild one. But I really like this kind of trend in reggaeton and Latin pop that is incorporating those elements of hyper pop and more experimental sounds and production. It's really cool. Next up is number eight, which is Beatopia by Baby Doobie. I hope I said that right, I'm not sure. She is an indie pop and kind of singer-songwriter-esque artist. And there's a lot of softer moments on this record. But the moments where it's like a full band with guitars and everything really remind me a lot of the kind of 90s, um, not necessarily Riot Girl, but the edgier female pop artists of the 90s so like Alanis Morissette, Liz Fair, uh, that kind of stuff and even some of the female fronted indie rock bands like the Breeders or Throwing Muses uh, it's it's all kind of got that very 90s college rock vibe um, and it's really good it's, it's nice to see someone carrying that torch from that era because that's an era that I really like a lot of the music from but it feels like it kind of died off um, but it is seeing a resurgence with bands like Bia Doobie. at number seven is yet another Latin hyper pop reggaeton experimental album whatever you want to call it and it is Trampantojo by Malaca and this one leans a bit more into trap influences. It's got these like big chord progressions, these sparse instrumentals, especially in the first track where the chord production is coming from a choir sample, which is awesome. Uh, but then in later tracks, you have these like overblown horns and this really like crunchy bass tone that really bring home the in-your-faceness 
of this record. Number six is Special by Lizzo. And I have been a Lizzo fan for nearly 10 years since I accidentally saw her live at a music festival in 2015, playing to a crowd of maybe 200 people, if that. Uh, and that show was insane. It is one of the most fun and most unexpected shows that I've ever seen. Uh, and yeah, she continues to be a great pop artist. Uh, I do like her older stuff more when she was more rap focused rather than, you know, just singing, but it is what it is. That's what happens when people make it big, I suppose. But yeah, this was awesome. What more can I say? Everybody on the planet has heard about damn time. Number five is Magic Man by Jackson Wang. Wang? I don't know. Sorry. Uh, I'll be white about it. Jackson Wang. Uh, anyway. It's the album Magic Man. And I like an album, especially a pop album, that feels cohesive. Like, all the songs work well with each other. The sequencing is good. The pacing is good. And this just feels like an album rather than a collection of songs. And Jackson's voice is great. The instrumentation is great. The production is great. Highly recommend this one. Not just to fans of K-pop, but to fans of pop and indie rock in general. It's really good. Number four is Grey Suit by Suho, which is another K-pop album that isn't really K-pop and I think would appeal to a much larger audience. This one takes its cues from a lot of Britpop and the more like rock-based R&B. So if you're a fan of like Coldplay, Snow Patrol, uh, even Bright Eyes, things like that, I think you'll like this one a lot. The songwriting, the composition, the full band feel of it, Everything is pretty close to perfect on this one. And sitting at number three is Eastside 2 by Yoasobi, which is one of the very few J pop bands that I actually know of and like listen to. I really need to get more into this scene because this album is so much fun from front to back. It's just. It's a blast to listen to, and that's something that I want to make an effort to get more into. So actually, if you have recommendations for J-pop uh, groups or idols or anything like that, feel free to leave those in the comments, and I will listen to them at some point. Number two here in my pop albums list is... Two Mirrors Facing Each Other by Lipsticism. And this is an artist that I became aware of through their collaboration with Fire Tools on a song called Race for Titles. Uh, and their vocals are just so beautiful and ethereal. And the production on this album matches it wonderfully. It just, the whole album feels like a breath of fresh air. It feels like a cleansing rain on a hot summer's day. It's just, there's something about it that is so breathtakingly beautiful that I can't recommend this one enough. Go listen to it. I mean, finish this video first, but then go listen to this one because it's amazing. Alright, so if you've been on the channel for a while, this should come as no surprise to you that Mercurial World by Magdalena Bay is my number one pop album from 2022. They, they just they have such chemistry and such songwriting ability. Every track that I've heard from them is great. The deluxe edition of this album specifically, that is how you do 
a deluxe edition. They interweave the bonus tracks, the extra tracks, into the album instead of just throwing them all at the end. And so it's an entirely different experience because you have all these alternate versions and slightly different track listings uh, between the regular and the deluxe edition. And normally I don't care too much about deluxe editions if it's just like demos and acoustic versions and live versions and all that shit. That re doesn't really interest me. But the remixes and the alternate versions on this deluxe edition are so worth hearing that I actually think the deluxe edition is the definitive version of this album. Uh, and yeah, like what more can I say about this? You guys already know I love Magdalena Bay and I need to go see them live. So I'm going to try and do that soon. But yeah, that is my number one pop album from 2022. So that gets us halfway through our genre top tens. Let's get into the second half with my top ten punk albums. So we'll get started with There There 3 by There There There. And it took me longer than I want to admit to realize that the album title is not self-titled. Um... Uh, with the band. With that aside, this is excellent, mathy, post hardcore, Midwest emo type music. Uh, if you are a fan of Chon, Sean, Chon, I don't know, Covet, um, bands like that, Polyphia to a certain extent, uh, this one's going to be for you. But it has a, has a bit more of a punk edge to it with the vocals and some of the riffs as well. At number nine, we have Editors with EBM. Editors is a band that I've been into since they came out with uh, Munich back in like 2004, 2005. I love their first two records. They're some of my favorite post-punk albums of all time. Uh, I like what they've done post An End Has a Start, but not quite as much. Here on this album, though, they brought in... Benjamin John Power of Blank Mass and Fuck Buttons fame. And they took it in a lot more of a traditional post punk, like first wave post punk direction, um, and EBM, as the title would imply. And honestly, this is my favorite album of theirs since An End Has a Start, which is a really high bar for me. And I love this one. I'm excited to see how far they can take this sound with uh, Benjamin Power in the mix. And here at number eight is Otoboke Beaver with Super Champon. And this album is a fucking blast to listen to. Front to back, it's just, it's so much fun. It's so fast and so chaotic, but so upbeat at the same time. It has the energy that reminds me a lot of, like, Toy Dolls and Descendants and a lot of those classic punk bands like that, Black Flag and Bad Brains even. Um, but these girls just have so much energy, and the album feels like it's bursting at the seams and, like, they can't contain it all within a record. Uh, it's 18 tracks in 21 minutes. It's fast, it's short, it's in your face. It is everything a perfect punk record should be. And also with this one, I recommend watching their live performance on KEXP. It's on, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's fucking cool. They, I need to see them live. And speaking of short, fast, loud, and in your face, this is number seven, Jumping, Dancing, Fighting by Hammock. And the record sounds like it's doing just that. It's mathy, it's hardcore, it's got some really interesting and innovative guitar tones on here, and it all just, it works. I would consider this more of a mini album, it's seven tracks in 16 minutes, but it made its way onto my list because it's awesome, and I like it. At number six is Fall Asleep to Regret by Dead by Sunday. And the whole time I was listening to this thing, I was like, man, this sounds like it came out in, like, 2003. Um, it 
it has that vibe of like early My Chemical Romance, Thursday, Taking Back Sunday, uh, that whole kind of scene. And come to find out, this is actually a compilation that was released in 2022 of songs that were recorded originally in the early 2000s. Uh, and I debated on whether or not to include it on my year-end list because I don't normally listen to compilations. But I put it on here because I listened to it not knowing it was a compilation, for one thing. And for another thing, if you're a fan of any of those bands and that style of music in general, this is a fucking amazing example of it. This band should have been huge. I don't really know what happened to them or why they're getting a reissue in 2022, but I'm glad they did, and I'm glad that I got to hear it because this this compilation, I believe, is everything they ever recorded, uh, and it's awesome. Highly recommend this one. And number five is Roman Candle by Funeral Chic, and this sounds like a grindcore band's take on Motorhead and Entombed. So do with that what you will. It's thick, it's grimy, it's greasy. It The cover implies a lot of what it sounds like uh, on this one. And I don't really hear a lot of bands doing this kind of style nowadays. And it's something that I really enjoy. So... I'll be interested to see if this band does move farther in this direction or if they kind of go back to their grindcore, hardcore roots. Number four is Mystic Sisters by City of Caterpillar, which is a post-hardcore record with emphasis on the post. It takes a lot of cues from post-rock and the kind of expansive, open arrangements, lengthy build-ups, dynamic changes and shifts. Um, and then explosive climaxes uh, that a lot of post-rock has. Uh, you could draw some parallels to Slint uh, from this record. And this is a band that I think went like 20 years without an album. I think they only released one in like the early 2000s or something. I'm not quite sure on that. I think uh, I think there was quite a gap in between their records though. And... They're back in full form. Number three is Hellfire by Black Committee, which shouldn't be a surprise if you've been around the channel. I watched the video for Hellfire, no, Welcome to Hell, uh, when that came out and fell in love with it. I have actually listened to Black Committee since their debut and they just keep getting better. This album is a proggy orchestral noise punk mishmash of a bunch of shit that doesn't sound like it would work but it's like I don't know Pink Floyd meets Mr. Bungle and it's insane it's I love this thing man it's it's so good number two is another noise punk record this one is Defluencer by a Crowd of Chairs and what sets this one apart for me is the vocals it's their vocalist has this kind of laconic, almost laid-back style on a lot of this that I haven't really heard in any other bands. Maybe like Shellac. But even then, Steve Albini's voice is a bit more like, I don't know, harsh than this guy's voice, for lack of a better term. But it's a really interesting combination the vocals and the instrumentation on this record. And at number one is Precedent by Sonagi. They are a new band and, and this is a hell of a debut. Mm, I don't remember the last time a record made me feel the same way that I felt when I heard Relationship of Command by At The Drive-In for the first time, uh, but this one did that. And I'm not really comparing the two sonically. There's just a certain vibe and energy that both of them have, for me at least, that I look for, especially in post-hardcore screamo music. Um, and this this band hits, this album hits. Definitely going to be following them to see where they go from here. I highly, highly recommend listening to this one. 
And so let's move on to my favorite country music from 2022. At number 10 is Wise River by Kitchen Dwellers. And I think bluegrass gets a bad rap. It's not all just a bunch of hicks singing about their women. Uh, And if you need proof of that, listen to this whole album. But if you're only going to listen to one song, listen to the track Sundown. It's track five on the album. And you tell me that bluegrass doesn't deserve an open mind. Because this album's cool as hell. Number nine is Railroad Cadences and Melancholic Anthems by Jose Medeles, who is a drummer uh, playing a vintage, I want to say, like, 1930s or 40s kit on this record. Uh, And in collaboration with three guitarists who are M. Ward of She and Him and solo work, Marissa Anderson and Chris Funk of the Decemberists and all three of those guitarists have really unique styles that all shine on this album and if y'all know me you know I love music that sounds like the desert and this is exactly that it's a really nice really like peaceful listen and a good way to like sit back read a book and just enjoy an hour of your life Number eight is Love the Stranger by Friendship, and there's not really a whole lot to say about this one other than you either like alt-country or you don't, or you're in the third camp of people who think that calling it alt-country is just an excuse to not say you like country music, Uh, but there is a difference. This is not anything like Johnny Cash or Willie Nelson or whatever. This is more in the vein of Wilco, Pedro the Lion, that kind of stuff, so... Personally, I would call it alt-country, even though I'm not afraid to say that I like country music. And I like this album. At number seven is the self-titled album by Jamie McDell, who is a New Zealand-based country music artist. um, Which sounds weird to me because I think of country music as being exclusively American, but I know, like, Keith Urban is Australian and shit, so they're out there. But... Yeah, this album's really good. It has a lot of the sort of Appalachian kind of vibes. Not in a negative connotation way. uh, But just there are distinct regions of country music within the U.S. And this one is more of the Appalachian Nashville flavor of country music. At number six is Starlight and Ash by Oceans of Slumber, who you may have heard of before. They are a metal band but they made a country album or at least like a bluesy country tinge doom metal album so I put it here because I hear more country influence on this than I do metal influence and a lot of people particularly in the metal community seem to think that country and metal are like opposites or at least incompatible with one another but man I disagree. There's a lot of great southern rock and metal out there, and this album is a beautiful blend of both genres. Number five is Chica McComico by American Aquarium, who are pretty well known in the alt country sphere. There's that phrase again. Um, This album, I think, is really what country is all about. You know, a lot of people call country. The original emo music and yeah it's uh it's pretty heavy this album in terms of like the emotional content not necessarily the sounds but yeah it's it's pretty sad but there are moments of hope and uh triumph and things like that but country to me really is just about regular ass everyday people and all the experiences that they have and this album captures that really well and at number four we have Bronco by Orville Peck who is a anonymous masked country singer 
um, in the vein of outlaw country like Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, uh, Johnny Cash, people like that. And when this came out, I didn't really see anybody disliking it. It seemed like everybody kind of loved this one, which I imagine is how a lot of people felt when Johnny Cash was dropping new records. And, you know, there are quite a few similarities between the two, I would say, vocally and sonically. Uh, but Peck here has a lot more, like, psychedelic influences and even some, like, shoegaze and punk influences as well that makes sense as to why everybody liked this when it came out because this record is awesome number three is in real life by mandy moore and for a pop star doing a country album uh which i don't think is her first country album i think she's been moving in that direction for a while but this is a lot more than just a pop country or country pop album it's got a lot of like structural intricacies to it in the songs and the background vocals remind me a lot of 60s psychedelic pop uh, which is a wonderful added little touch to the album and Mandy's voice is beautiful the lyrics are great this is just a really really solid album Number two is Welcome to Club 13 by the Drive-By Truckers. And, man, I mean, if you have if you don't like country music, you're probably not even watching this section of the video. But if you're here and you're not quite convinced, just listen to the first track on this album. Just, just do it. Like, uh, it's so fucking good. <laughs> the rest of the album is also really good but i feel like it doesn't quite live up to the standard set by that first track but it's a pretty short album it's only 42 minutes so it's i would recommend listening to the whole thing and finally at number one is quaalude lullabies by chris canterbury um looks like this is his first album i couldn't really find much uh before this other than a couple singles which are just tracks from the album um definitely going to be following chris canterbury for the future because his lyrics his vocal tone the emotion that he puts into his vocals the arrangements of the songs the pedal steel everything about this is just so like if you had told me this guy was 30 years into his career i would believe you it's this is incredible for a debut album so definitely gonna be looking for more from him highly recommend you check out chris canterbury and the album quaalude lullabies and that brings us to our final genre which is rock now that's a very broad genre so there's going to be quite a variety here to start us off at number 10 we have i'm not sorry i was just being me by king hannah this is a country tinged slowcore album with elements of more straight ahead like blues rock on there and also a few moments of trip hop influence like the wonderfully named track Fulius Caesar uh, almost sounds like it could be a Portishead track from their first album and it's just it's a wild blend of influences but they pull it off really well and at number nine we have hyper relativization by eve six that's right the heart in a blender guys uh and the now famous on twitter guys uh i'm gonna be honest i love their first record i know a lot of people you know call them a one-hit wonder and whatever that whole album's really good but i have not listened to a single thing they've done since then with the exception obviously of this album and this album is really good. It does not sound like the same band at all. Uh, but this is a nice set of punky power pop. Um, and even if you don't like the Heart in a Blender song, which I actually can't remember the name of off the top of my head. Oh no. Uh, anyway, if, even if you don't like that song, this album's worth a listen. 
Number eight is Coping Mechanism by Willow. Yes, Willow Smith, Will and Jada's daughter. Um, I didn't know what to expect with this one. I hadn't listened to any of Willow's music before. I'm pretty hit or miss with a lot of Jaden's music. Um, but Willow definitely takes after her mother. If you didn't know, Jada Pinkett Smith used to front a metal band. I forget what they were called. Uh, but you can look it up online, I'm sure. Willow was born to be a front woman in a rock band. This album is really, really good. And I might go back and listen to her older music. I don't know if it's all like this. But if it is, I'm a fan. I'm definitely a fan of this album, at least. Number seven is Phototroph by Moontooth. Um, this is probably a little more on the metal side than on the rock side but I put it here because of the vocals uh, the vocals are clean and I put it here because it's got like a pop sheen on it in terms of production and it's got a country tinge to it as well on a lot of the uh, riffs and a lot of the vocals um, I feel like this one is divisive because, you know, I haven't seen anybody talking about it, but I feel like it's one of those albums that you're either going to love or you're going to hate. Um, just because of the way the production is and the blend of influences that are on it. But I love it, so hopefully you will too if you decide to check it out. All right, so number six is In Spirit by Pop Strangers. And... I was not familiar with this band before. It looks like they did put out a couple of albums in the early 2010s, but nothing past that until 2022. And if you're looking for a frame of reference for this band, and this album at least, uh, think of any rock band from the 90s. And there you go. It's got traces of the slack rock scene, like Pavement, Dinosaur Jr., it's got hints of mid-90s Radiohead, like the Benz era. It's got hints of some slowcore, like Low or Red House Painters on there. Uh, it's just, it's all over the place, but in a good way. Number five is Mojigata by Marilina Bertolti. I think I said that right. I don't know. Sorry if I didn't. Anyway, this album at its core is a blues rock album. But there are a few moments where it deviates from that. And those moments are some of the best ones on the album. Like one of the tracks veers towards hyper pop with the vocals and auto tuning um, that they do on it. And it's awesome. It's not really a Latin rock album, even though it isn't Spanish. It's more of just a blues rock album with Spanish lyrics. Number four is God Get Me the Fuck Out of Here by Cold God. Um, this is shoegaze for fans of heavy music. It's along the lines of some of my Bloody Valentine's heavier stuff. Um, Swerve Driver, Ride to some extent. And more modern acts as well like Were and Nothing. So if you're a fan of any of those, this one's going to be for you. Uh... Is this his first album? I don't know. It's not. But uh, it's his second, and I'm looking forward to more. Number three is the self-titled album by the Mars Volta. They're back after a 10-year absence, and they sound like a completely different band. For some people, that was good. For some people, it wasn't. Obviously, for me, it was good. I love this album. It's it eschews a lot of their prog rock grandiose self indulgence of their first few records. Um well all of their records prior to this actually. And goes in a more pop structured, almost R and B esque vibe. And I think the way that Cedric's voice has matured suits this really well i don't think he would sound good blasting out those like intense in your face 
vocal lines that he used to do on their earlier albums because his voice has changed. And a lot of people don't like that because Cedric's voice is part of what makes the Mars Volta the Mars Volta. But I think it's wonderful, personally. I think it's great that they've leaned into that change and developed a sound that is still unique to them and still singular while also adapting to that change. Number two is God Save the Animals by Alex G, which is really a pop album disguised as a country album disguised as a rock album. Uh, there's so many different ideas and influences going on in this one, but Alex G's songwriting ability is just so amazing that he's able to pull everything together and make something that sounds cohesive even though it does pull from so many different sources. And at number one is Bleed Out by the Mountain Goats. Uh, man, I listened to this album for the first time less than a month after my best friend passed away. And just the themes and lyrics right from the first track, Training Montage, just really really hit home during that time and I think that is the beauty of the mountain goats is that they're always relevant to whatever situation you're going through I remember after my dad passed away a few years ago I went straight to the sunset tree uh, it, it, they just there's something about John Darnielle's lyrics and songwriting that captures those emotions of hope in the face of grief and loss, uh, just beautifully. And the Mountain Goats, I was hesitant to get into them for a very long time because I just, I don't know. I their discography is huge and it's overwhelming but it's so worth getting into them all of their albums are so good um and this is probably in my top five of their albums for me personally so yeah i don't know i love this album i go back to it every few weeks probably i would say it's been in pretty constant rotation for me And I lied, we do have one more genre to get through, and that is several genres actually, jazz, funk, and R&B. At number 10 we have Ultra Sound by the IG Band, the IGG Band, I don't know. Uh, this is actually a re-release of an album from 1980, as you can see there on the album cover. Uh, I did not realize that when I was listening to it, or I probably wouldn't have included it. And honestly, it should have been obvious because the music sounds like it's from 1980. But if you are a fan of that 70s, 80s funk sound, this one's definitely for you. The bass lines on this are incredible. At number nine is I Am Nie by Nie. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. Um, she is a Korean R&B artist and the production on this is incredible it's got that like really smooth wavy vibe to it that just kind of makes you feel like you're floating in an ocean on top of the songs and i love that production style that is one of my favorite styles of production especially for r b and hip-hop at number eight is archipelagos by other lands which is an improvisational ambient smooth jazz album and it sounds about like what you would expect from that um, and I am not going to say too much more about it because this is something that you should just listen to for yourself number seven is you never know by Club de Elf which is another one that you just kind of have to experience there are so many influences on this everything from Middle Eastern music to jazz fusion to hip-hop to ambient there's some like 
punk feel on some of the tracks. Oh, it's just, it's very, very singular. I've not heard anything that's like this album before. At number six is Dreams by Elephant Jim. They are a Taiwanese trio who make like sort of math rock and sort of jazz. It's kind of in between the two, uh, but I put it here on my jazz list because a lot of the vocal lines and instrumentation are more rooted in jazz than in rock. And they also incorporate a lot of traditional Taiwanese influence as well. Number five is Hyperdimensional Expansion Beam by The Comet Is Coming. And they're one of the more well-known jazz collectives of the modern age, I would say, um, outside of the sphere who normally listens to jazz, at least. Um, And for good reason. They're awesome. They are a trio of synth, percussion, and saxophone. And... I don't know. It's just, I've been listening to them since their debut album and they just keep getting better. They're so unique and so like identifiable with their sound. It's, it's fucking awesome. Number four is 99.965 by Venta, not to be confused with the metal band of the same name. This one is a Korean jazzy R&B artist and the instrumentation on this one is phenomenal the vocals also remind me a bit of Soyeon from G Idol or uh, what's her name Hayes as well so it's got kind of that almost nasally but not in a bad way tone to it and it's really beautiful Number three is Doppler by First Beige. This appears to be their debut album. Not too sure on that, but I couldn't find anything from before this on title. Um, this is a modern jazz funk album with these kind of like indie pop vocals on some of the tracks that I really enjoyed. At number two is Shaded by I'm assuming it's pronounced Shades. Not quite sure on that. Uh, But this is more of an EP than an album, really. But it's got jazzy vocals over that smooth, smoky R&B type production with a lot of dub influence on there as well. And even a little bit of almost drum and bass influence, too, which is a really unique combination for me. And I'm looking forward to seeing more from this artist. And at number one is Natural Brown Prom Queen by Sudan Archives. This album has a little bit of everything on there. It's rooted in R&B, but there's influences from jazz, funk, African music, house music, drum and bass, rock. There's just so much happening. Uh, and it's experimental, but it doesn't sound abrasive or it doesn't sound like it's forcing itself to be weird. It feels, for lack of a better term, natural. And I think that's one of the things that I love most about Sudan Archive's music is she is very much herself and she's not afraid to put that out there and get a little weird on her records. And now it is time to get into my top five EPs from any genre from 2022. At number five is She, Her, Black Bitch by Dochi. And all I'm going to say about this one is this is a level of confidence and swag that I can only aspire to. She is amazing. Go listen to this one. At number four is Wing Theory Part 1 by Tom Jarmy. This is a series of three EPs, and I will say right now that I haven't listened to the other two yet. Um, Even though the second one also came out in 2022, I just, I didn't get to it. But this one is ambient techno and drum and bass. And it's just really smooth, really melodic, very 
easy to listen to. Number three is Just Begun by Just B, which their label has called a mini album, but it's five tracks in 15 minutes, so I'm going to call it an EP. Uh, anyway, I didn't listen to a lot of K-pop in, well, from 2022, because I was planning to get to it on the channel, and I never did. Um, so a lot of K-pop from 2022 has kind of gone under my radar. But I did listen to this one, and I like their harsh, kind of EDM-y, almost rockish sound. I haven't listened to anything else from this group, but next time they have a comeback, I might throw that up on the channel. Number two probably looks familiar to you. This is Shaded by Shades again. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because I already talked about it in the last section. And number one is Blood 1983 by In This Moment. Synthwave and Metal were born to be together. There's just something about that combination that works so well. And I love this little EP. I don't really know if they're like doing Synthwave now or if this was just kind of a one-off thing since all the tracks end with 1983. Uh, but either way, it works. And now we are at my top 22 of all genres. Most of these are going to look pretty familiar because they have shown up in the other sections. So I'm just going to play some music and you can watch the countdown.
And my number one album from 2022 is Garbage Island by The Burning Hell. And this is an anti-folk record. It may be one of the best anti-folk records I've ever heard in a genre that I already love. The range of emotions and the honesty of the vocals and the lyrics and the diversity of the arrangements and the instrumentations and the melodies and the songwriting on this album is unlike anything I've ever heard. It is so so good I laughed I cried I was dancing and even singing along to some of the tracks uh, like the first time that I heard it it's just it's so catchy it's so well written it's so 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 good if you're not going to listen to any of the other albums on my list please do yourself a favor and listen to this one